Excellent. So we're finally done with football season. We can get back to the work of the Lord instead of the work of the Patriots. I was really hoping that I had prepared that line all week hoping that Paul Gould would be here so I could really rip him. And he's not here. Paul. But I, no, I like, I like the Patriots. You know, I'm from New England and so I'm happy that the Patriots won the Super Bowl. But I'm very, very happy that we're kind of past that season, you know, so we can actually get back to the work of the ministry and uh, put our attention back kind of where it belongs, you know, off of football. But this one's for the guys and Katie. Um, you know, when, 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 don't you just have times where like, and I don't like to promote football because it's a big competition with the church, but don't you have times where you just like, this is this game you really want to watch? You know what I mean? And, and you know, and I am speaking mostly to the guys here, but, but, but um, you, you just want to watch that game and, and you just know your wife doesn't want you to watch it because she wants to like do something with you. You know, yeah. no, I'm just kidding. You know what I'm saying? You just want to watch that game, and it's just that special game, and your favorite team is playing, and, and, and you know if you even ask, it's just as bad as if you just do it. You know what I mean? Like, you know not even to ask. Um, but at that very moment that you're about to, to shy away from asking, that's when this, this is when your wife comes up to you and, and praise the Lord if this happens. And she comes up and she says, you know, honey, my best friend just called me and she wants to take me to lunch at one. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and, then, and then what happens is you find out what restaurant she's going to and it's like, you know it's a restaurant where she's not going to finish her meal. So you know she's coming home with leftovers, right? And it's like this big win-win, you know what I mean? It started out as like, man, I'm just I'm going to rot in hell for this. She's going to hate me. Um, but it turns into a win-win, you know what I mean? Do, do you know what I'm talking about? And of course, that would be in the Johnson home. It's a complete reversal. Dan does not want to watch football, but Katie, you know, it's one of those Ohio State games, you know. So, so, so but it's, it's a win-win. You ever, you ever been in one of those situations where you just kind of know it's going to work out for, for both people? I say that because I believe after studying the scriptures for some time now, I believe that, that the Christian life is, is really that. It's, it's a win-win. What I mean by that is that when you read the scriptures, it's not just about God, and it's not just about you. It's really about both. It's about God, and it's about us. It's really, it's about your good, and it's about his glory. The kingdom is about your good and his glory. So, when you, you, and the reason why I say you, you hear scripture verses like, like where it says that Jesus came, I came, he said, that you might have life abundantly. So when he says you have life abundantly, would you say, would you agree with me that that, that, that means that, that you'd have a good life? And it doesn't mean you're going to be like, you know, rich and you're going to, you know, be really just built and have this great everything. I mean, it's, that's not what I'm talking about. But whatever that good life is, would you agree when he says, I can, you want to have abundant life, that it would be, hey, man, what's up? How you doing? You're here. here. That's awesome. That's good. So, so I <laughs> love you, man. So, so would you agree that it's to have a good life, right? So he said, I came that you would have abundant life. But then it also the scriptures say that whether you eat or drink or whatever it is that you do, do it all to the glory of God. So he says, I want you to have a good life. I want you to have some things. I want you to do some things. But while you're having them and while you're doing them, I want you to do it all for me. So it's really, it's about my good and his glory. Would you guys agree with me? Do you, do you agree with what I'm saying? So um, this week, um, as I was reading through the scriptures, I found a, a spot in the Bible, one of my favorite books of the Bible. We actually taught through this book several years ago when we were over in, uh, in the UMAC in Tavares at the Methodist Church way back when, and I, I taught through this book. It's the book of Philemon. And, and some of you might go, that's even in the Bible? You know, like, is that, what Bible do you read, you know? It's a new translation. It must be because I've never heard of it. It's a really small book. Um, this, this, what I'm going to share with you tonight, we did not cover three and a half years ago. This is something different. But it's a, it's a book that Paul wrote to this guy. Guess what his name is? Oh, you are so smart. So this, this, Paul writes this book, and it's a one-page book. It's not even a page. It's towards the end of the New Testament, it's just before the book of Hebrews. And I would invite you to go there with me if you don't mind. I don't know if we have the page up there or not. Do we? Yeah, all right, there we go. 
If you have your own Bible, you'll kind of be able to find it. You'll navigate your way there. If you don't have a Bible, Jared, you can open up yours to that page-ish. It should be somewhere around there. Your baby's sitting. <clears throat> Paul starts to talk to this guy, Philemon. Let me give you a little, just a quick little background about Philemon. Um, Philemon is a rich man. He, has, he owns slaves. He owns property. He has a business. And this guy has a slave named Onesimus. And Onesimus runs away. Now, Onesimus is a slave, and so therefore he is a piece of property. Do you understand? That's not a good thing. Slavery's not good, but it is what it is back in the day. Onesimus is a piece of property. Much like I own this chair, if I owned that man, it's the same thing, same bit of value. And so he runs away, and what we understand is that he's now thrown in jail because he stole something. Now, did he steal something else from Philemon? I don't know. Did he steal himself? See, as soon as he leaves and he has no permission, he's stolen property, hasn't he? So he, he gets arrested and he gets thrown in jail and, and chance would have it that he gets thrown in jail next to the Apostle Paul. Guess who's getting saved? This, this Onesimus. No, not Philemon. Philemon's saved. So this is what happens. He shares the gospel in jail with Onesimus. He gets saved. He accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior, just like many, if not all of us, have here. And so he writes this letter back to Philemon, who's a brother in Christ, who's a Christian, just like us, right? And he says, listen, I know you're a Christian and you've done some good, but I want you to do even better. I want you to rise higher. I want you to be really, really like Jesus here. So when I'm going to send him back, and when, he, when I send this slave back to you, I don't want you to treat him like a slave. I want you to treat him like a brother. I want you to not say, all right, welcome back. Now get back to work. I want you to invite him into your house like I was coming. So Paul says, if I was coming to your house, you'd, you'd make a room for me. You'd set out uh, dinner for me. You know, you'd treat me who, with who, uh, the respect that I deserve. And I want you to treat this slave as if I was coming. So he says, I know you did good, but I want you to do better. And there's a reason why he wants him to do better. And this is what we're going to study tonight. The reason he wants to do better is because God has so blessed Philemon. And because he's blessed him so much, it's not obligation. It's out of the love and, and, the, and, the, and the thanksgiving for what God has done for you, Philemon. In response to that, because of what, I've done, what he's done for you, I want you to do something for me. So this is where we pick it up here in Philemon. And it's in verse 4. This is what Paul says to this guy. I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love of all, I'm sorry, for all of God's people. And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. So what I want to do with you tonight is the first and foremost, I want to go over what he says here to Philemon. I want to take some time. I'm going to give you four things that we have in Christ. He says, uh, let me repeat this, verse 6. And I am praying that you will put into, uh, put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience. That's what he wants. He wants us to understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. So that's what we're going to do first. We're going to discover some things that we have, these good things that we have in Christ, and then we'll see how we're to respond to that. Now, the first thing that I want to share is not one of the four, but it's the foundation of the, of the other four. And, and really, we could just go on for weeks and weeks and talk about all the things that we have in Christ, but I'm going to just give you four things tonight. But the first one is this, and all other good things stem from this one good thing, okay? Now, to understand what this one good thing is, you have to go to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians, and you go to uh, chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. And I'd love for you to read it with me. I mean, not out loud. You don't have to read it out loud. But I want you to read it, because I don't want you to think that I'm making anything up. I want you to walk out of here believing that you heard the truth, not something that some dude made up. Okay, Ephesians chapter 3, 
Verse 18, you ready? Are you there? Holler. You there? You there, Shauna? I don't see a Bible in front of you. Just as bad as your, it must be in the family. Just, huh? <laughs> okay, ready? Verse 18. And may you have the power to understand. There's that word. What did Paul, what did Paul say to Philemon? I want you to understand and experience all the things we have in Christ. So this is what he says. And, I, and may you have the power to understand as all God's people should. So that means everyone in this room. How wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience, so you see that? Again, he wants us to understand and experience. And what is he saying here? I want you to have the power to understand the love, and I want you to experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to fully understand, we get that. Then, in other words, once you understand it, and once you begin to start experiencing it, then you will made, you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. So here again, I think you could see in this text that when I say that, that all other things will come from this thing, you can see that if you can understand and experience the love of God, then you'll be complete and full of life. Like you'll have everything else because it all comes from God's love. Everything you have in Christ is because God loves you. Okay? Now, here we are. Here's the first thing. Because... Because God loves me, I have freedom. Because God loves me, I have freedom. See, the world tells us how to live. We're in a culture that's very, very, um, uh, it's, like a, it's like an evil dictatorship, even though you don't know it. It's under the, 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 this illusion of freedom that you can kind of do what you want, but, but yet we're, we're so pounded with influence that this is the way you're supposed to live that we're just, we're just victims. We just, we just fall into place like cattle, like soldiers, okay? And so th this is what I wanna, I wanna say, that when you have freedom, the first thing that you have as, as, as a result is this freedom to live. When I say freedom to live, let me explain what I'm saying. Um, in, in our world, uh, happiness and joy and success, they have, there's a picture. We can all picture that in our mind right now, what that might look like. And we all have a little bit of a different picture. But I would guarantee that most of the people here, at least in our country, there's, there's some material in that. There's, there's a, maybe a house. There's maybe a, a spouse and some kids and a car and a job. You know what I'm saying? You have some stuff. I, there's, there's some of that in there. But let me give you some, let me give you some freedom. Because let me, I got news for you, and, and maybe you guys can amen with me. Not everybody gets all that, right? I mean, not everybody gets all that, right? There's some common grace. Like, we all get air, but we don't all get big houses. We, we all get um, food, but it's not as good as some others have. And we, we, we don't all get there, and we don't get to that level of success that, that the culture puts on us. Let me give you some freedom. You guys ready for some freedom? Habakkuk 3.17, Old Testament, towards the end of the Old Testament. Let me show you what freedom looks like, okay? I'm going to show you what freedom looks like in, in the life of the believer. <clears throat> Habakkuk, I know that's another one of these Philemon books, right? Habakkuk, yeah. Habakkuk 3.17. Okay, not everybody has massive abundance in the area of prosperity and houses and, and big bank accounts and retirement funds and great careers and, and great jobs and power and prestige and influence, you know? Most of us are just regular, everyday folks, right? We're everyday folks, but there's some freedom in that. There's some freedom. You ready? Habakkuk 3.17. If you don't have it, just listen. Habakkuk says this. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms, and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive, olive crop fails, and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields, and the cattle and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. That's freedom. That's freedom. That's, that's the joy that surpasses understanding. That's when the, the situation of our lives, the circumstances, do not infringe upon my joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 
And even though I don't have all the things that my culture says I need to have, still I will rejoice and be thankful in the God of my salvation. That's freedom. You have freedom to worship. We all worship something. And he's saying you could worship me beyond all the things that your culture tells you you need to have in order to be happy. That's freedom. Freedom is, is seen again in Matthew 6 where he says, listen, all these things that you think you need, the Father knows what you need. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and all these things that you need, not what you want, not what the TV tells you you need to have, not what the magazines say you need to look like, but all the things that you need, I shall give them to you. That's freedom. That is freedom. That is freedom. Romans 7, 6 is another way we can be freed. See, the world tells us how we're supposed to worship him. And look, rules, they don't, they, don't, they don't generate authentic worship. When you are obedient to your parents only because you fear that they will spank or ground you, if you do not speed only out of fear that you will get caught and have a ticket, if you, do not, if you don't rob a bank only out of fear that you might get arrested, that's not authentic Okay, let's give you the authentic, Romans 7, 6. True worship comes in a different form. Romans 7, 6 says this. But now we have been released. That's freedom, right? We have been released from the law. For we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. See, people are always trying to impose these rules on you and how you should worship God. You should wear this, this clothing, and you should sing these songs, and you should eat this diet, and you should go to church on this day, and you should follow this law, but not that law, and you should follow this, you should follow... Listen, that's not the way it works. See, it's not about the rules. The rules, I read, I read, was it yesterday or today, that the rules were like, I'm not ripping the Ten Commandments because they're awesome and, and they're spiritual and they're beautiful, but like if you think about it, is not killing each other the height of human experience? The, the, really, you know what I mean? Like if I, is me not stealing your stuff the height of human experience here? It's the low. It's the bare minimum. He's like, listen, can you just not kill each other. That's a good start. Stop stealing my cookies. Hey. Whoa, hey. You should know better than to leave them out there. Get your own. That's tempting. That's evil. <laughs> it's rules. And we're not, to, we're not to live by rules, okay? It's all about, and you hear it in church all the time, it's not about rules. What's it about? It's about relationship. It's about a relationship with God. It's about the Holy Spirit saying, hey, Joey, I want you to do this. And you go, yes, I'll do that. It's saying, Paula, don't do that. Okay, I won't do that. You know what I'm saying? That, that's what it is. It's freedom to worship him. It's freedom to worship him. Here's another thing we're freed up of. Freedom from sin's power to kill and condemn. Romans 6, 7. While you're in Romans, take a look there. Romans 6, 7. You guys probably already know this because we just went through Romans. But Romans 6, 7 says this. For when we, and I'm not going to talk a lot about it. I'll get to this in a minute. Um, we're going to be talking about this dying stuff the next three weeks. I'll talk about that at the end. But uh, Romans 6, 7 says this. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. See, we were set free from the power of sin. Now, does that mean that you're going to be perfect all the time, that you absolutely will live a sinless life. No, it does not. Amen. What it means is this. The wages of sin is death. It says in, in Romans 5 that through this one man, Adam, all people will experience death. But through this one man, Jesus, we've been given freedom because eternal life is now available to any person. All of us. And so the power of sin, what sin does is it puts a guilty stamp, a guilty verdict on your soul, and it sends you where? Down. But what Jesus said is, I release you of that penalty. I release you of that charge. You are now free from that charge. The power of death no longer has you. You will live. You are free. You are free. I don't want to go into it too much. Here's another one. We are free to serve. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. A lot of Bible tonight. Galatians 5, 13. <laughs> Fr 
cranky. Galatians, <laughs> chill, 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 chill. You know, I don't have a whole lot of attention span. You can't ruin me. <clears throat> Galatians 5.13, we're free to serve. We're free to serve. See, that's not the way our culture really uh, dictates, does it? What's our culture say? Serve me. Take care of myself. Take care of myself. Look out for a number one, but don't step in number two. That was, the, uh, that was Rodney Dangerfield who said that. Do you remember that one? Listen, Galatians 5.13, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. Now, what does that mean? Do whatever you want. Take care of yourself. Acquire some more stuff. More success. More, a little more cash. You've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, there's something better, isn't there? Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Is that normal? Yes. No, it's not. It's not normal. That is not the way common culture is, is it? To serve one another in love. It's very, very much centered on ourselves. We do things for ourselves. We spend most of our day taking care of ourselves. Do you go to work? It's just this a funny little silly example, but do you, when you're in the morning when you're getting ready to go to work, are you packing lunch for your buddy or are you packing it for you? Me. I'm not condemning. I'm just saying, I mean, normally you're packing your lunch for yourself, right? That's just the way we are. We kind of take care of ourselves first. But what the scriptures are saying here is I want you to adjust. Now that the Spirit of God lives in you, you're a believer, you're a new person. And so I want you to kind of adjust the way you think that maybe we could spend our lives pouring out our lives in service to other people that they might know Jesus. Okay, that's what he wants us to do. Galatians 5.1. So Christ has truly set us free. Now here's the fourth thing under this first thing of freedom, and, and it, it kind of goes hand in hand with, with this Galatians 5.13 of, of, of serving, and it, and it summarizes the previous three things. Like, wh why do we, okay, we're, we're free to worship him, and, and we're free from the power of sin to condemn us and say that we're guilty and we have an eternity separated from God, and we're free to serve other people. Now, there's a summary statement found in Luke chapter 4, and it's from the Old Testament, but Jesus quotes it here concerning himself, and of course, we're to be like Jesus, and he's, he has uh, commissioned us to be prophets just like him, to go, uh, to go to all the nations and tell people about him and baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and make disciples. So this is what Jesus came to do, and so he says, this is what I came to do, and therefore, this is what I want you to do, and you see it in Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19, it's in red, and he says this, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus is speaking of himself, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Here's the freedom. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that's freedom, that the blind will see, that's freedom, that the oppressed will be set, what? Free. Free. So what, what I'm saying here is, when I say it's a summary statement, he's saying, that, listen, this whole idea of not being able to worship freely not to be able to, to operate as God has designed you from the beginnings of the earth and, 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 and to be able to, to serve other people. Like these things are not common. And, and all of us, it says that the law says that we're all guilty before God. And so what Jesus is saying here about himself and then of course about us is that we have been sent to let all other people know about this freedom that they have available to them that we've been given freedom to worship him, that we've been freed, we've been freed from the, the rules of common culture. We don't have to live like that anymore. And we could serve and love and forgive and all those, those amazing things that Jesus is that we are released and we can live like that. And so our job is to go and give them the good news that they too can be set free. That's what we're to do, okay? Freedom, freedom. So those of us that are in Christ are free. Free to serve others by making the same freedom known to them. So we've been, uh, because he loves me, he sets us free. And here's the second thing. Because he loves me, he gives me his spirit. He gives me his spirit. Um, there's a lot of things that you get when it comes to the spirit of God. But if we're to be a little bit selfish for a moment, what, what's, I mean, what's the, 
there's a lot of things, but what's the greatest thing? Let me think about this. What's the greatest thing that you get personally when you say yes to Jesus, you bow the knee, and he gives you his spirit that now dwells in you? What's, what's the greatest thing? I mean, we could probably argue about it, but I'm going to throw this one out there, and you can tell me if you, if you agree or not. But since the spirit of God is eternal, and since the spirit of God has eternal life, therefore we have what? We have eternal life. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, right? We can get a gift, and we can get some this, we can get some that, but at the end of the day, the only thing that you can't get back, the only thing you can't buy is time, and he just gave you all of it. That's an amazing gift, right? That's an amazing gift. But there's more to it than that, okay? There's more to it than that. You get, you get eternal life, but the other thing you get is you get this thing, that it's called the fruit of the Spirit, See, and I don't want to rip you guys down, but if I wasn't honest with you, I wouldn't be doing you any justice. No good thing, no, no good um, uh, attitude, no good behavior, no good change in you comes from your New Year's resolutions. Like you can say, I'm going to, you know how many times I said I was going to lose weight? I mean, seriously. I mean, yeah, right. And it's, it's just not working, okay? I, it's obvious, Okay, it's obvious. So, so, so like New Year's resolutions, like I'm going to be nice, I'm going to eat less, I'm going to exercise, I'm going to be nicer, I'm going to do all these things. Like they don't work, right? It just, it's just bad, 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 bad. It just, it's, it's, it's lip service. It just doesn't fly. Okay, so anything that good, anytime you become more Christ-like, it's because the Spirit of God, this is what the Scriptures say, and I believe that it's true, that the one who began a good work in you is continuing to do so. So he's inside of you. And like, don't ask me the chemical makeup of this. Don't tell me to pull out the chemistry set and say, explain to me how the Spirit of God works inside of my kidneys and, and my liver and my heart and all these things that makes me different and better. Like, I can't explain that. It's one of those supernatural, freaky things, but it happens, Right? Then all of a sudden you're just different. You meet somebody and you're like, hey, he's not the same jerk as he used to be. He's still a jerk. He's just not as bad. He's just not as bad. You know what I'm saying? Like you see there's a change in someone. You know, they give their life to Christ. They start reading the scriptures and they're praying and they're going to church and doing this. And, they, and all of a sudden they just start acting different. And so that's the spirit of God inside of you changing you and making you more like Jesus Christ. The scriptures say that he is the one who gives us the will and the desire to do what pleases him. We're, we're, the scriptures are so true, and I'm finding this out more and more all the time. As I live, as the days go by, no one's seeking God. No one truly is good. You know, we're all kind of rotten in our own way. We're getting better, though, right? We're not, we're not perfect, but hopefully we're, we're progressing. That's a good word for the night. We're not perfect, but we're progressing, and the Spirit of God is working in us. From the moment we bend the knee to Jesus, he, can, he stays in us and he's working on us, giving us the will and the desire to do what pleases him, to start changing who we are. My, my normal responses, they change. My default changes. My perspective changes. My worldview changes. My attitude changes. I start becoming more, what, kind and patient and loving and faithful and good. And hopefully a little bit more self-discipline, although if my friends would stop putting cookies in front of me, that would make it a lot easier. Self-discipline. Any good change comes from God. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit. So not only do we have the Spirit, but He does some changes in us, and He gives us a gift. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Take a look. Every single person that bends the knee to Jesus, gets the Spirit of God, and then he gives you a gift as if he's not enough. He's so kind. He's so good. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us. That's good news, right? Would you agree? Do, do, you, think it's a good, do you think that's a good gift? Look at your neighbor and say, that's a good gift. It's a good gift. You get a good gift, right? That's awesome. Who likes gifts? Who loves their birthday or Christmas when you get stuff? It's awesome, right? How about this, though? 12.7 goes on. It says you get a gift, but it's not for you. 
<laughs> yeah, that's what a lot of people feel. <laughs> exactly. But it's, but, 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 but. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Some translations talk about to edify the body, which is the church, to build up, to strengthen, to enlarge the church of Jesus Christ. We all get a gift. So we get the gift, we get eternal life, we get him working in us to make us more like Jesus, and then he gives us each a gift, some type of a talent, something special in each one of us, that if we will exercise that thing, the whole church is healthy, growing, and full of love, and that's exactly what we all want. At the end of the day, we want that, don't we? We want the, G the church of Jesus Christ to be healthy, growing, and full of love. And listen, the only way that happens is if each and every person who says yes to Jesus, who receives the gift of the Spirit, and a gift from the Spirit, exercises that Spirit to build up the body of Christ. And when we all do that, you gotta tell this world to look out because we're gonna make a dent in hell. That's what's gonna happen. That's what's gonna happen. So when we get the Spirit, we get the fruit of the Spirit, the change inside of us, we get the gift that we can use for other people. Here's the third thing. Because we love God, he gives us freedom. Because we love God, he gives us the spirit. And because we love God, he comforts me. He comforts me. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Did you ever, I know I'm not alone, have you ever had a time in your life when you're just, when you're all alone and you just feel like you're at the end of the rope and thank God there's a knot at the end because if there wasn't, you'd fall right off. <laughs> you just feel like it's just, you can't take it anymore. Anyone ever been there? Just like, I'm, I'm just done. I, I, I can't pay my bills, no relationship works, I, my job, I just lost my job. I, I mean, it's just, and you just feel it just piling and piling and piling on top of you. And you just get alone in, in your room or wherever, I don't know where it is, and you just, and you just cry. You just cry. And you just weep and you just beg God. Have you ever been there? God, if you'll just do this, I'll go to church every week. Come on now, right? I will, I will, I will grab that offering plate ooh, and I'll fill it up, Lord, if you'll just do this. No, but you just get to that place in your life where you just feel so defeated and so down and you've tried everything and it just, nothing's working and you just find yourself on the floor kind of fetal, and, and you remember, you know the, the carpet's wet from your tears, you're just crying and crying and crying, and you're just calling out to the Lord, and then all of a sudden you just, I don't know what it is, like we all have different experiences, but it just seems to, you feel that weight just come off you, and you just go, man, I just, and you get up and you just kind of brush yourself off, and you're like, man, thank you, I just needed that, you know, you ever been there? I've been there lots of times, and if you haven't, it's coming, <laughs> And if you have, it's coming again, and your, your carpet will be wet with your tears. But we all have those experiences. And let me read this to you, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 through 7. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. You see, it's a two-fold ministry there. He comes to help you so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you, then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. So a lot of these gifts are 
for us. They're, for those of us that are in Christ, we have some gifting that has been given to us. Like the Spirit is in us. The, the fruit of the Spirit's working in us. We've been given a gift in us. But some things transition from in to out. And sometimes it just transitions right out of you, whereas He gives you something, and it's not just for you. Not for that moment. For that moment, it might be yours, but it's to receive it, to rejoice, and then pass it on to others. And that's exactly what happens here. It's not just for us. It's for others. It transitions from us in to through. Let's just breeze through that. Here's the fourth thing. God loves us because... Because God loves us, he gives us freedom. And because God loves us, he gives us his spirit. Because God loves us, he comforts us. But because God loves us, we have family. That's what we have in Christ. You know, I want to start by saying that not everybody, and this is a, this is a highly debated issue here. I hear it all the time. But you know that not everybody's in the family. Not everybody is a child of God. Let, let me explain what I'm saying Genesis 126 is where it all starts, right? He makes people. And he says, God says, Let, let's make man in our image to be like us. So I get that, that, that we're like God in some way, shape, or form. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're all his children. We are like him. We are his creation. But we're not, all of, we're not his kid. See? Like, I am... I, um, I don't know you, but you have two eyes, and so do I. What a coincidence. I'm not yours. You know what I'm saying? Like, we have beards. Um, so I'm kind of like you. You have two eyes, and you have two ears, and a nose, and a beard, and two legs, and two hands. And so would you say we're kind of, I'm kind of like him, right, in, in a way, but I'm not his kid. So all of us are like God in some way, but we're not his kids. Let me tell you why. Um, if you go to the book of John, you don't have to necessarily go there, but you can write, write down John 1.12. But in the book of John, the author, John, says, uh, in the beginning was the Word. You find out that he's talking about Jesus, that the Word is Jesus because he puts on skin and lives amongst his people. That's Jesus Christ. He says, the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that all things that have life, all that life came from him, and nothing that has life has life outside of him. It's all from him. And he says in John 1.12, but to all that believed him, Jesus, for all that believed Jesus and accepted Jesus, he gave them the right to become children of God. See, there's a separation there. Everyone, you hear it all the time in this politically correct world that, no, we're all God's children. Okay, no, we're not. You're, you're God's creation, but you're not his kid. So you have to be adopted into the family. You need to be reborn. You need to have a regeneration. You have to, have, you have to be born of the Spirit. Or otherwise you're just a walking zombie destined for the dirt. Okay, so not all of us are children. But those that believe in Jesus and accept Him as Lord and Savior, He gives them the right to become children of God. We see a similar uh, explanation in Galatians 3.26. For all, this is great, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, through faith in Christ Jesus. See, not, all, not everybody is a child of God. Not everybody is a child of God. And so therefore, you won't live in His castle all the days of your existence. Not all of us will. There's different choices, you know. I like multiple choice when it came to school, but I don't like multiple choice when it comes to this. But let me tell you about the multiple choice. Not everyone's going to choose to let the God, the God of heaven and earth, the God of the Bible, be their father. Some of us choose a different father. Do me a favor, and, and look, I'm, I'm not going to explain all this to you in length tonight, but I want you to just see something, and then I commend to you the, the, God, the book of 1 John to read it in its entirety. But 1 John chapter 3, go here and look at it. 1 John chapter 3 tells us that we have some options. It's a multiple choice. We get to choose who our father is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. Yeah, I know, but I want to go to 9. It is 10, but 9 gives us a little context, so I want to read it. Holler when you're there. Okay. Okay. 
Ready? Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning. Can I pause you there for a second? Because I don't want to scare anybody off. This doesn't mean that you don't sin. Because the scriptures say that all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God, and all of us fail in many ways. Okay? We, we do. I get it. I want to be perfect. We all want to be just like Jesus. That's the goal. Okay? But there's a process, and we all fail. But this says those who make a practice of. You know, like, hey, I want to get better at drinking. I want to get better at adultery. I want to get better at lying. And I don't care who it bothers. That's practice. That's not what a child of God does. It says here, chapter uh, 3, verse 9, those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. His Spirit's in them. So because the Spirit's in them, so they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Some would say, huh? yeah. Now, I don't want to talk about that too long because there's a whole theology lesson there. But I do know this, multiple choice, right? We have a choice. We can decide who our dad's going to be. The offer is made. The gift is available. You have to choose it. I can choose to sin and keep getting better and better at it, or I can choose to stop and I can make God the father of my life. Okay? So we're his kids. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, right, and he's given his spirit to you, you're his child. That's a reason to celebrate. We're his kids. We're his kids. Romans 8, 29 tells us that Jesus would be the big brother to many brothers and sisters, and that we... His little brothers and sisters would be conformed into his image. We would become more and more like him as time goes on, as we allow the Spirit to work in us. And we hear the voice and we say, yes, we become more like Jesus. But he would be the big brother of us little brothers and little sisters. So that means when, God's, when I say God loves me, we get family, we, we get the ever-present Father we get the protector, the provider, the savior, the defender, the lifter of your head, the great gift giver. You know, he disciplines the ones he loves, and he's the kind of the never leaver and never forsaker father. We get that. We get that. And here's the thing that floored me, and I never get tired of telling you guys this, and I want you to, you should memorize this. Is there a bee up there? Is that what you're looking at? No. What are you looking at? I'm looking at how many crosses are on the border. I have an idea. Hey, I have an idea. Frank, I have an idea. Why don't you listen? <laughs> Just a thought. You're naughty. I never get tired of telling you this. And, it's, and in my Bible, it says, whoa. And in John 17, 23, it says that God the Father loves you, Joseph. That God the Father loves you, Frank. That God the Father even loves Jared. I know. As much as he loves Jesus. That's crazy, right? We could just pack it in right there. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> Knock you out, boy. That he loves you as much as he loves the Son. That to me... I don't, even, I don't even know, like I don't know what to say to that. You know what I mean? Because like you, you, you know, you know how much he loves his son Jesus. The whole Bible's about that. The whole salvation thing, the whole crucifixion, the whole resurrection, it's all about this crazy love. You know, you know that, that he loves Jesus, but he loves you as much, Katie? That's crazy. And to me that just, like don't lose that. Like, don't lose that. Like you, that should be something you should talk about all the time. You should just reflect on that, 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 that God the Father, the, the creator of heaven and earth, he loves you. He loves you as much as he loves Jesus Christ. Did you know that, Jessica? That's crazy. That's crazy love. I should write a book about it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's crazy. So we have a father and we have brothers and sisters, right? And, and just like look around you for a second. Look, look in the room. Look at your friends, right? 
These are your friends. And, and, and think about the, 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 you know, these are your besties. You hang out with them. You text each other. You call. You go to dinner. You babysit each other's kids. You help each other move. You just do stuff. Huh? <laughs> hey, we're supposed to be givers, not takers. We're, we're, seriously, I mean, think about, I, I know that my greatest friends are in this church. You're my best friends. And I know you love me, and I love you. And I know that you pray for me, and I pray for you. And I know that anytime I need something, I don't call outside this church. I call here. And everyone always helps me. And I hope that I can be the same. You know, like, uh, th listen, I'm, I'm, I'm just nothing, but that's what I'm talking about is when, when a friend calls and shows up at your door at 11.30 and says, hey, I need a ride home. There's no questions asked. Hey, I need my car fixed. And Jared's, as much as I pick on him, but he's one of my dear friends. I need my water pump blue. I'll be there in an hour. Done. Right in the middle of his work day. It just gets done. Where does that happen? Where does that happen? In the church. Right here. This is, the, this is what God has done. The, the reason why we're all here is, I, like, I didn't know that you guys were going to be here. You didn't know that these people would be here. You just, Jesus drew you in, and then when he drew you in here, he gave you this. It's a gift. We're, we're family. The, the scriptures tell us in Proverbs 17, 7, that a brother is born to help in time of need. And, and, and the scriptures tell us that we should share each other's burdens, and I can tell you that in my Christian walk, in my years of being a Christian, I've never seen anything like this church in my life. In my, my new life, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen people help each other and be there for each other like this. I mean, the other night, we, we surprised, is Candy over there? She almost jumped out of her skin and collapsed like jello when you all went to celebrate her party to celebrate your friendship, to celebrate how much you love her. And she walked in and she just lost it right then and there because of the overflow of love shown to her. Like that's what, that's what you get. Above and beyond everything else that you get, you get this. You get family. We're blessed. Hebrews 12, 15 tells us this. This is a really great scripture verse. You should definitely underline this one, highlight it, whatever do you do in your Bible. It's okay to write in the, in the Bible. Um, Hebrews 12, 15 says this, to look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. To look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. You know, I was sharing with you a few minutes ago about how sometimes when things are really, really bad and you're on the floor and your tears are soaking the carpet because you're so scared and you're at the end and you just don't know what to do anymore. You, you guys have been there before. I've been there lots of times where I just didn't know what to do anymore. I just couldn't accomplish what needed to be accomplished. I didn't have it within me to do it. And I just begged God. You've been there, right? So, so this is what happens. What, what this is saying here is, 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 is if, if you're on the ground and you're crying and you're crying out to the Lord and I need this, I need this, I need this, this is what God does. Like, I'm improvising here. I don't, this won't happen. But he's going, oh, wait a minute. I remember. Hold on a second. Hey. He needs something. Come here a second. Come. No, no, seriously. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Remember that money that I get? Yeah. Okay. Sit down. Yeah. Watch this. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Do it. Tell him. He needs something and you have it. That's what he's saying. I don't know what that is, but it looks expensive. That's awesome. When do we start building? And I'm just kidding. So, so, so this, this, what I'm saying is like, that's what he does. That's what he does. He's like, he, 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 he blessed him. You can go back to your wife now. He blessed him with something, right? God blessed him with something. And, and this guy is like on his hands and knees begging, God, I need help, I need help. And God's like, I know, I remember. I gave Mike that. He's got that. He's got that resource. So he brings him over here and he just says, okay, go, do your thing. Do it. And it all works out. That's the Holy Spirit thing. That's what he does. 
I don't even understand it, but he does that stuff, right? Do you ever be, you, be, you know what I'm saying? When you have this great need and all of a sudden someone knocks on your door and says, hey, I need to give you this. God told me to. That's like crazy stuff, right? But that's what happens. And what he's saying here is like, be open to that. Be aware of that because you might be the answer to someone's tears. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not just pennies from heaven. It's not just hundred trillion dollars falling down. It's, it's, it's be aware, look at each other, be, be aware of what's going on in each other's lives because you, you, you need something and, and you got something and if you put the two together, God gets the glory. It's awesome when that happens, right? He's like, don't just focus in on your own stuff. Be cognizant of everything that's going on around you and your family so when someone's on their knees, it's not just pennies from heaven, you might be the penny from heaven. You might be the one that has the resource. You might be the one that ha he needs a job and someone has the job opening at their company. You might need the diapers or you might need the money. Or you might need the ride and we might have that, right? Or, or maybe we don't have it, but maybe we have the connection. Maybe I don't have the job for you, but, 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 but she does. They need someone at her place. And so come on over here and you sit down and you make it, and it all happens. That's what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> That's what it was, it's supposed to work that way. All these things, they're all good things, and we have them in Christ. We have them in Christ. I need a drink. We've been given freedom. We're free to worship and, and to function as we were designed before the beginnings of the earth. Not, not to function by the way the culture tells us, but but we're, we're supposed to, to be able to freely worship him outside of circumstance. And, and we're not supposed to worship him by rules. And of course, there's no death. When those are in Christ, we now live and live eternally. We've been given his spirit, so we have the, the fruit of and the gift uh, from. We've been comforted and we've been given family. Now let's go back to the text. This is where it all um, it transitions for all the things that you have in Christ. Something's got to happen. Because otherwise we get to be fat Christians. And nobody wants a fat Christian, right? You're supposed to give it out. Listen, look at, this is what Paul's saying. You've got some things in Christ. Those are just some of the things. But what does he say? He says in verse 6, And I'm praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. So what he's saying here is that the, the understanding the good things in Christ that you have and experiencing these good things will build your faith in him. Like the scriptures say that we don't live by sight, we, we live by faith. I get that. But let's just be honest for a second. The more God does, the more you can believe. You're like, man, he did this? And that's why we share testimonies. He did this and he did that? Wow, I can't believe he did that. And when you start hearing all these stories, you start building this trust in this God. You can't see him, but you see the fruit of what he's doing and you start believing him more and more and more. And what he says here is the more you understand what he's given you, and the more you experience those things, the more you believe him. And as a result, what you do in active response is directly proportional to that which you have. That's what he's saying. He says, so when you get it, you give it. It moves from in. In other words, the, the in is in direct proportion to the through. What God gives you, he says here, should, read the text. He says, what God gives you should bring much joy, comfort, and refresh the hearts of God's people. Everything that God gives you in Christ should bring joy and comfort and refreshment to other people. So he totally transforms your life. You get to live differently. You get a new purpose. You get a new gig. So you're free from, from this world. You're free from the law. You're free from the guilt of breaking the law. And what you can do now, since you've been freed to worship him and to live outside circumstance, and even though there's no, there's no uh, figs on the trees and no food in the barn, still I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. See, that's not normal. But because you now are free for that, what he's saying here is when you get to experience and understand that, now you get to go give it away. You get to go share that with people. So now they can live in freedom. You see, it's in direct proportion to what you've received. You've been comforted in those storms when you're just on your face crying and he just takes that load off of you and you're like, man, that feels so good. But now listen, you're an ambassador of Christ. 
The Spirit lives inside of you. So just as God, the unseen Spirit, has comforted you in your greatest trials, when you're on your face soaking the carpet with tears, now you, you can be that same to someone else. See, when he gives you comfort, it's not just so you can go, I feel better now. It's so that you can feel better and then pass it on to someone else. It's, it's in an essence, you're kind of like the Spirit's representative. You're almost like the Holy Spirit in that. You can go and be that comforter to someone else who's on their face crying and begging for the Lord to help them. You can bring them comfort. You can display the fruit of the Spirit and you can leverage the gifting that you've been given to reap a harvest for the King instead of just hoarding it in and never utilizing it. And then you can be part of a family. And when you're part of a family, people just bless you. I know you guys have blessed my family in crazy ways. So you're all good brothers and sisters. But now when someone comes into the family, they get to enjoy that too. But now we've been given an opportunity since we can understand and experience all this love. Now I, too, get the opportunity to be a great big brother or a great big sister to you. Whatever you do for me, I can reciprocate and do back to other people. It's a beautiful, beautiful situation. I can be a helper. I can be, I can be the one who provides the blessing. I can be the one who can deliver you when you're on your face crying. I can be that guy if I'll be aware of everything that's going on. God's all about your good and his glory. And his plan is to place his spirit in you so you're free from the ways of the world and free from the rules so you can worship the way you're supposed to. His plan is to comfort you in life's biggest troubles and struggles so that you too can comfort other people and to place you in a family of faith that lives out life with you. And in return, as you experience all these blessings, you'll help others to be free, comforted, and be part of a family so God can receive more and more glory. That's what it's all about. And that's what Paul's been telling Philemon here. Just took me a while to get there. He says, all that you experience in Christ, as you begin to understand all that you get, and I hope that tonight, when you proclaim his word, you understand what you get. Now, experiencing it, that's a whole other issue. That's, now it's when God's people step in and start to live this thing out. If you're cognizant of everyone around you and you make sure that you might be the, con you might be the conduit to the blessing, you might be the one who helps that person in great need, you might be the one who comforts that person when they're on their face crying and crying out to the Lord, maybe you're the one that God uses to bring blessing into their life. Amen? Amen? So you've been given truth, now it's up to you. You do with it what you will. A couple things before we, um, we worship. Again, um, we won't be taking our offering. Just put it in boxes if you'd like. Um, we're going to take communion in a moment. I'd like to ask a couple guys to come up and grab these communion elements. And, I'm, and we're going to hand them out. And then we're going to take it together as a family. But before we do that, I want to uh, mention to you a couple things. First of all, thank you very much for letting me do what I do, and it's an incredible privilege to do what I do, and I, I don't take that lightly. I mean it. I love you guys. Um, remember I told you we were going to sponsor this kid heavenly? Well, I've got some good news, and i got some bad news, and then i got some good news, all right? Let me give you the good news. Now, the bad news is that we're not going to sponsor him. The good news is that somebody did. That's awesome. Okay? That's awesome. So he's taken care of. Um, but then the good news is this. Because we couldn't sponsor Heavenly, it forced me back to the computer. You can give that out. Just go ahead and give it out, and we'll take it together as a family. Because we couldn't sponsor Heavenly, it forced me back to the computer. Can I grab that? And I had a look. So I prayed. I asked God to guide. And he brought me to another little guy. Can you put his picture up there? That's Emmanuel. God with us. So here's the thing about Emmanuel. He's five years old and he lives in Tanzania, which is in the east 
coast of Africa. There's a lot of AIDS in that village. And both of his parents have died. So he doesn't have any parents. And he's living with his grandparents. And that can be a tremendous burden when you make $18 a month. In this area here also, you'll know that there's a lot of uh, sexual exploitation of young little boys and girls. And so there's a center there that a church brought to this, I can't pronounce the city, Sing Singadu or Singapore, or I don't know what it is. Um, but I'll have the details for you when we get the package. But we've been able to change this little boy's life because we're going to sponsor him. And so this little guy here, Emmanuel, God with us, uh, we can change his life. And so now he's going to be able to go to this Christian center and he'll be given the nutrition that he needs. He'll be given the, the health attention, you know, medicines and stuff that he needs. Um, he'll be given the education that he needs so he can flourish. And of course, above and beyond all things, he'll be able to be taught about Jesus. And so I'm very, very excited. I took it upon myself to make that decision on your behalf. I'm, I'm quite sure that you guys don't mind that it's, I mean, I hope it's okay. And um, so I know it's terrible. But uh, so that was good. So that's this little guy. We get to, uh, I want to pray with, with you for a moment uh, for him. Um, also, I just want to let you know these next three weeks will be leading up into Easter. And for the next three weeks, we'll be preaching a series called Put It to Death. We get to, before the resurrection, of course, Jesus goes to the cross. So before this new life, something has to die. And so these next three weeks, we're going to be talking about some of the things that really need to die in our lives before we are raised to new life. And so we'll preach that series and then we'll have Easter Saturday here at Revolution Church, April 4th at 6. And I, I ask that you would take these cards and use them to invite people to come and celebrate the resurrection with us. Father, we thank you for tonight. I thank you for um, singing over us. I thank you for the freedom that's here in this house of worship. I think it was quite obvious tonight that we are just a family of faith that love each other and love you and um, I think we do church right here Lord and, and I hope that you're pleased I thank you for beginning a good work in us not only individually but as a church family you began a good work and you'll continue to do so that is your word and we trust in that uh, Lord I want to ask for your great blessing upon holy upon angel and now upon Emmanuel Lord, we pray that they would come to know you and that their, their relationship with you would deepen and strengthen as the years go by. I pray, Lord, that you protect them from the evils of this world that want to exploit them and harm them. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we know that, Lord. We see it all over the earth. But, Lord, you have come that those who accept you would have life, have it to the full. And we pray for that for these three children, Lord. We thank you for bringing them into our lives so we could be aware a greater awareness of the, of the struggles that are across the earth. And I thank you, Lord, for putting us into action, to, to putting action in our hearts, to step in and, fa and faithfully give so that we could bless these children. I thank you, and I ask for your blessing on all of those at this church that have said yes to that. Thank you so much. Lord, I'd like to take a moment of quiet before we take these elements to allow you to do some work in us. This, we talked about a lot of things tonight, Lord. Everybody gets something. So, Lord, whatever it is that you want to work on us right now, just quiet moment, I pray that you do that. Spirit, have your way. Lord, you reminded us of all those things that you've given. We realize, Lord, that all good things come from above. Anything good that we receive in this lifetime is because of you love. Because you love us, that's why we have freedom. It's because you love us that we have your spirit in us. It's because you love us that you comfort us. And it's because you love us, you place us in a family. 
None of these gifts are available unless the great gift giver gives us a son. And so we celebrate now as we take this communion, we take these elements, we celebrate Jesus Christ. And it's because of Jesus that we receive anything good. It's because of Jesus that we have freedom. It's because of Jesus that we have his spirit and we have eternal life. It's because of Jesus that we are comforted in life's greatest trials. It's because of Jesus that we've been brought together as family so we could share each other's burdens. It's because of you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you. And now we acknowledge what you did to make all this possible. This bread represents your body that was given for us. Take it in remembrance of him. And the cup represents his blood which was poured out for the, for the forgiveness of sin. Take this in remembrance of him. Lord, I pray that your spirit would work in us mighty. Mightily. Mightily, mightily, mightily work in us, Lord. Help us to become more like you. Help us to desire the things of God greater than we do now. Help us to desire your word. Help us to treasure it. Help us to want to spend time in prayer. Help us to want to spend time in fellowship with other believers. Help us to want to keep an eye out for all other people so we could be the blessing that they so desperately call out to you for. Help us to be a family of faith that lives authentic Christianity before the eyes of a lost and hurting world so they might come to know you and love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. On Christ the solid rock I stand No double-minded shifting sands On Christ the rock I plant my feet A firm foundation for me On Christ the rock I place my heart and trust in who you say you are no circumstance that blows my way will ever move this solid place oh, oh. Solid rock I stay.